Hello everybody and um, I hope you all enjoyed lunch. Welcome to the afternoon session. Um, my name is Lisa Black and I'm going to be chairing this afternoon session and um, I'm going to introduce myself because I'm giving the first talk. So. <laughs> um, I work at Afby Cross Creevy where I'm head of station there and our focus is looking at plant varieties, agronomy and soil health. So without further ado, I'll, I'll go on to the first slide. So I've been tasked with giving a soil health overview. I only have about 10 minutes, so it's really an impossible task, but I'll do my best to pick out some particular um, pieces of work and um, that, that are appropriate to, to the work we do at Cross Creevy and in AFBE. So soil health um, was an emerging concept in the early 2000s, and it's more and more been aligned with the concept of one health, which is looking at human health, animal and plant health, and also um, the environment. And I think that's very much come out in the talks already, where you know it really does touch into all aspects of, of our um, productivity in terms of producing food for human consumption, safety of food, and also the environment. This slide really shows um, just a little bit of text from the Soil Health Inquiry from the UK Parliament in 2016, and basically stating that healthy soils are important for food production and human well-being. And we can't actually me measure soil health directly. Um, so indicators of soil health are physical, chemical and biological parameters, processes or characteristics. And um, in order to be good indicators of soil health, um, parameters need to be relevant to soil health. They need to be easy and economical. They need to be sensitive but not too sensitive so they're responding to you know, temporary oscillations and in, in changes in the, in the soil environment. And they also need to respond to management practices. So when we're measuring soil health, what we really want to do is be able to get a baseline for the impact of change uh, for positive results. This is a, a really lovely diagram that I've pinched from Layman's Hall. It's a nature review, and it's on the concept and future prospects of soil health. And what I want to draw your attention to is the three um, axes. On the left, we have biological indicators. On the right, we have chemical indicators and on the bottom we have physical indicators. So this is um, a graph depicting all the soil health indicators that have been used across global soil assessment scenes, schemes. Sorry. And the little grey circles represent um, the number of indices, uh, sorry, indicators and the size of the, the circle means uh, the larger the circle the, the greater the number of indicators. So you can see immediately there's a real uh, overpopulation of um, indicators towards the chemistry side. Very little on, on the biological and also a, a sort of a lack on the physical as well. Now, this isn't unsurprising because up until now, soil has really been a medium for growing crops and the importance <laughs> of that has been to ensure that nutrients are there for crop growth. But I think as we move forward into the One Health concept, we do need to populate uh, over in the biological and physical side. Now I want to move on to some of the indicators that we've been using in Northern Ireland in uh, AFBE projects, and we have been looking at chemical, physical, and biological parameters. In terms of chemical and physical parameters, we have been looking at Olsen P, which really gives you an indication of um, the availability of uh, phosphate for plant growth. We've heard pH is really critical and impacts on soil processes, nutrient availability, and also microbial populations. And I think we've heard today that in Northern Ireland, certainly there's a way to go to optimizing pH across um, the landscape. Cation exchange capacity is um, an indication of the ability of a soil to release nutrients for plant growth. And in terms of physical measurements, we have bulk density that's related to compaction. And we're also using a penetrator logger to look at um, soil penetration resistance. And this indicates the ability of soil to carry um, uh, land uh, weight, sorry, and also um, the ease with which roots can penetrate the soil. You'll see immediately in terms of biological characteristics that this has been our focus in some of the work we've been doing in AFBE um, and uh, listed here are all the parameters that we've measured across a range of environments um, uh, and also experimental um, trials. I've included soil carbon and nitrogen there. Some people may say that that's a chemical measurement, but actually uh, they really are the cornerstones of soil biology and um, as was mentioned earlier, soil carbon and changing soil carbon is very difficult to measure. So 
part of what we're also trying to do is um, find um, indicators that potentially be used as, as proxy for change in soil carbon so we can measure how different land practices um, change carbon for the, be the better. Having said that, soils in, in Northern Ireland are high in carbon, but we want to keep that status. Soil microbial biomass, um, we've measured this using the fumigation direct extraction, which um, uh, was very much a uh, Rothamsted uh, development um, back in the day. Still a very uh, relevant method. Um, and we've paired that with a few other uh, measures of soil microbial um, communities. Um, one of those is PLFA, which is phospholipid acids, and that gives you an indication of the sort of the um, makeup of the microbial community. Um, beta glucosidase. Now, this is a soil enzyme. It's related to carbon metabolism, and um, also uh, it's an indicator of organic matter um, accumulation and, and soil carbon sequestration. So. This was included um, really to see if this could act as a proxy for changing carbon. And we do have initial indications that do show that that is the case. I know on the soil nutrient health scheme work, there is work going on on, on analyzing a whole range of, of enzymes. And I think that's really important work to, to take forward. But at the time we established this project, our focus was beta glucosidase. Earthworms, really important. The dominant soil fauna in Irish agriculture, Narch is gonna be talking about that um, later. And then Solvita CO2 soil respiration test. So this is an easy and efficient measure um, to look at soil carbon dioxide respiration. It comes in kit form. It's routinely used by um, labs such as NRM. And it's also used in the AHDB um, soil health scorecard, which uh, Elizabeth is going to talk about um, after I've finished. <laughs> So if you think about you know, the requirements for indicators, you know, they need to be responsive to change, they need to be easy to do, uh, they need to be relevant to soil health, and they need to be responsive. It's very hard to find one indicator for soil biology that fits all of those. But um, I'm going to talk about some very high-level findings that we have from this work. Um, basically, what we did was deployed all these indicators across a range of grassland and cereal experimental sites. Um, we have the long-term slurry trial in um, Hillsborough, which is from 1970, not quite as long as um, <laughs> the broad book. Um, although our comms experiment is younger than your new, as older than your new one, <laughs> John. So, um, and then we have an agroforestry experiment. We paired this with on-farm measurements across a range of uh, management practices. And for grassland, that was reseeding frequency. And for arable, we looked at organic manure use. So key findings, and given that we only have 10 minutes, um, these are going to be very uh, little snippets of what the, the totality of what we have, have got from these, this work. And also to say that a lot of this work is actually currently being prepared for publication. So um, hopefully you'll be able to uh, look at that in more depth then. Um, first of all, key findings in terms of soil carbon and nitrogen. So for the grassland fields, we um, categorize them according to um, the, the age of the sward. So short term were classes less than five years, medium term five to 10, and long term greater than 10. You can see that's a sample size of about 54. Obviously the soil nutrient health scheme will provide a massive amount of data compared to these initial um, uh, research work that we did. But even so, we have found some, some nice results. And just a snapshot, as I said, this is effectively total carbon and total nitrogen and the top 30 centimetres of the soil profile under the different um, sward ages. And hopefully you can see that in between short and medium term, there isn't a huge change in soil carbon and nitrogen, but there is a significant uplift once uh, swards um, get longer than 10 years. Um, now that's probably uh, food for thought, because if we're looking at a reseeding um, policy of every seven years, then we need to take this into account, obviously. Just to look at the soil biological parameters associated with this categorization of the data set we have, we have earthworm numbers, earthworm biomass, beta glucosidase, microbial biomass carbon, and soil vita. And this is just for grassland soils. And what we have found is that the relationships between um, these uh, biological parameters and land use do change depending on whether it's arable or, or grassland. But just to point out that we are getting significant um, correlation between sward age and beta glucosidase. So the older the sward, the more beta glucosidase we have. So that indicates that, yes, beta glucosidase potentially could be a proxy for a change in soil carbon. 
And just to look uh, more broadly at the data set, we have um, uh, what we've done here is look at the relationship between carbon and different soil biology measurements across grassland and arable soils, about 170 in total. And what we're seeing is we're getting positive, significant relationships between beta glucosidase, soil mi microbial biomass, and sol vita um, with soil carbon. So, as I said, this work is currently being um, worked up into publications. Um, I want to do one more thing, which is shamelessly plug <laughs> the Innovar project, which um, I coordinate. It's an EC project on next generation variety testing for improved cropping on farmland. That's the long uh, title. You may think, what has that got to do with soil health? Well, my belief is what we grow on the ground is really important for soil health and has a, a direct impact and, and leaves a legacy effect. And what we're doing in uh, Innovar is looking at how we can grow crops res with resilience and sustainably. So um, this also means that we are looking after soil health potentially. And um, I want to present some really nice findings from some partners in Korea, DC, which is in Milan. Um, the, the map on the left shows the trial series that we have across Europe. And these are harmonized trials and a really good resource for data to determine the impact of reduced inputs on crop production. So in terms of plant-soil interaction, some of our key findings are related to soil enzyme um, expression or soil enzyme in the soil uh, associated with plots of varieties. On the left, we have um, the soil cycles. We have carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, and a list of, of enzymes that have been measured. And this is comparing just two varieties um, as a snapshot to see you know, how do varieties impact um, soil health in terms of the soil enzymes. And what we see is there's clearly significant differences in the different enzymes between these varieties. So this is modern wheat varieties. That isn't a massively diverse genomic pan genetic panel, sorry. So, you know, picking up these differences is, is actually really exciting because if we think towards heritage varieties, which maybe have very different genetics to the modern varieties, then the potential to tailor land use, tailor crops to land use is really um, um, significant. Um, another thing that they picked up as well, which was really nice, was looking at the suppression of microbial biomass by the use of agrochemicals. So if you're using microbial biomass as a, a catch-all for soil health, which, yeah, we can argue about that, but potentially it, it is a good measure, um, what we're seeing is that fungicide treatment not only potentially uh, has health issues for the soil, Obviously, then that has human health issues, and that's a whole One Health concept. You know, if we can select varieties and grow crops which benefit the soil, they will also benefit um, us. <laughs> oh, jeez. Sorry, I don't know what that was. You, you all woke up, Ben. <laughs> I don't know what that was. Maybe I'm static. Sorry. I, I'm really sorry. I think I scared myself more than anyone else. If you were sleeping, welcome to the afternoon. <laughs> So, oh, apologies for that. Oh. Okay, ah, take home messages. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, originally I did have a slide in that was describing what is soil health, but PJ covered that really well. So, effectively, it's an emerging, complex, extensive discipline, and it covers all aspects of soil chemistry, physics, and biology. So it is really, really wide. I think we've seen that from the presentations already today. And certainly, um, from my perspective, working with plants, I think the biological side of things is really exciting, has a lot of potential. Um, yeah, what is soil health? We still have a consensus to be reached, and it's very much stakeholder dependent. If you remember the diagram of the triangle, you know, whether you're growing crops or you're interested in the environment, your definition will be different. Um, International research has, has largely been focused on chemical and physical parameters, and we need to, in my view, focus more on the biology. Um, we need to really work on how to assess soil biological health, and that's critical to safeguarding global soils. Second page, but last slide. Um, we need to, Af sorry, AFP research has focused on evaluating soil biological traits, which have the potential to indicate soil health. And what we're really excited about is the potential for quantifying soil enzymes and soil respiration to maybe use that as a, a proxy for looking at changing soil carbon and the impact of, of land use. In the environment we're in, in terms of agriculture and the landscape, we are potentially in a, uh, an era where we are going to be changing land use to some degree. So it'd be really important to be able to assess the impact of that on our soil health biologically. 
further work, uh, we need to look at the impact of plant species and varieties on soil health, so things like multi-species swords, co-cropping, protein crops, heritage varieties. And one really uh, positive output from this work, and it leads very nicely on to Elizabeth Stockdale's talk, is that we've been able to use some of the data from um, th this work to feed into the AHDB soil health scorecard, which is a really brilliant initiative for, for growers on the ground to benchmark their soils and see where potentially they might need to uh, improve things. Um, I would like to thank uh, collaborators and funders, um, Jira and the EC are key funders of the work that we do, and then I have selected a few collaborators there. And am I on time? Reasonably. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> So I don't know if anyone has any burning questions. I am on the panel later on, so I think given um, we're a little bit late, unless anybody really wants to ask me something now, I'm going to um, introduce the next speaker. Okay, so um, get to the right page, apologies. So really delighted to introduce Elizabeth Stockdale. She's Head of Farming Systems and Agronomy Research at NIAB. Um, she's over 25 years experience uh, of research and knowledge exchange in soil management, nutrient cycling and environmental impact and Elizabeth's been working on a really important piece of work which has been um, sort of an output from the AHD B BBRO, <laughs> Pharma Levy funded Soil Biology and Soil Health Partnership. So um, over to you Elizabeth, thank you. So there are folk in the room who are also involved in the programme who I'm going to be really mean to and probably make them stand up in a minute. But what I want to focus on is that need to manage soil health on farm and to take the, all the kinds of research that we've been talking about and make that practically useful. That's, that's the key to the Soil Biology and Soil Health Partnership. That isn't to say it didn't do lots of science too. So it was a big program running from 2017 to 2022, BBRO beat organization. AHDB at that point covering all, pretty much every other crop in terms of levy funding. So it's farmers' own money being used and directed to think about soil health. That set of projects within the overall programme was set within this big blue box. The big blue box, for those of you who've got really good eyesight, is called co-designed knowledge exchange. That means we worked with farmers, got them to tell us what they needed to know. They laughed at me, told me there's no chance they were going to do that, set me right, put me, and, and we developed what was going on together. And that informed and enabled all of those other research strands too, including informing things that were actually about developing innovative measures, particularly of soil biology. So looking at those molecular approaches for soil-borne disease, not forgetting that disease is just as important in the context of soil health as it is in terms of human health and also in terms of using DNA indicators. I'm not going to talk about any of that because that's science. I can talk about it, but I'm not going to. Because what we want to focus on is how we take what we know and turn it into something practical, which was what WP3 was really about, and about grabbing those opportunities to work with farmers, to take the information farmers had, and bring that together effectively with the science to drive practice. Now, if you do want a nap, this isn't a bad time to take it, because, A, I'm not going to beat up the microphone, and number two, actually pretty much all I'm going to talk about is on that website that's at the top there. So the ahdb.org.uk, Great Soils Collection of Resources, is where everything from the programme and a whole load of other stuff too is now held. So you can access this in a way that you can look at videos if that's better than listening to me witter on. You can read the publications, you can access things that are magazine articles, podcasts, there are all sorts of resources there including the reports, the detailed research reports which are written at for scientists and application uh, information that's directed at farmers. And at this point, I am going to make Joanna stand up so everyone knows who she is. So Joanna in the room is here, is an AHDB employee who's actually been crafting and shaping quite a lot of those resources. So talk to her later, not me, if you want to bend her ear. But really great resource set, developing and things coming out of the project. I mean, the key other people, and I'm not going to make him stand up because he was here before at lunch, but this wasn't just NIAB. This was a huge conglomeration of applied soil science and practice from across the UK. And so 
SRUC, ADAS and NIAB were the key underpinning applied soil science that was going on here. And we tried, didn't we, Lisa, to get Northern Ireland involved at the early stages of this, and we just couldn't make that work. But we've tried all the way through to align that with the things that are happening in Northern Ireland. And we're really pleased that we've now been able to bring some of this through to think about benchmarks and benchmarking in the context of Northern Ireland data. So if we're thinking about this, we have to recognize that there's no such thing as soil. It's not a singular thing. It's a huge diversity of different things. Those soils are the expression of their particular place and time. Soils on basalt, as we well know in Northern Ireland, are not like soils on alluvial sands. They don't behave the same. They don't work the same. And it's not just about the geology. It's also about the climate. So a difference of 200 millimetres in rainfall, that idea of moving from one side or up a hip, from one side of the country to the other or up a hill, can make a huge difference to the function of the soil. And there's a whole other things too. So we also know that that's not just about those big scale changes, but also local changes. So most fields have a wet corner or a heavy bit or something that's behaving. And farmers' own knowledge of how those things work is really critical to managing soils well. So we need to understand soil type if we're going to talk about soil health, but it's really important we don't muddle them up. Because soil type are the properties that set those inherent possibilities. They're like my character. I'm never going to be a marathon runner. I'm really good at eating cake. I could compete in that one. But it, so actually understanding the character, the, the inherent possibilities in a particular landscape, really important. That's what soil scientists, and I can do soil science, ca capture in that soil type description. But they felt the need to develop a whole language of weirdness to describe soil types. Those of you who ever looked at those soil profile descriptions, really accurate, really tight, brilliant, but impossible to read unless you've learnt to speak soil science. So there's a need to take that soil type information, and it's one of the things that Rachel Cream and her team did when she was in the other side of the border in the south of the island, to think about how we make that soil's information about soil type more accessible. Soil health is about how management that we do then affects those properties. It's making me as good as I possibly can. I may not be a marathon runner, but I can certainly be fitter than I am now. So soil health is about recognizing who I am and then making me as good as I can be in the context of soils. And it allows us, if we understand where we are, to then take informed action. If I'm brave enough to actually admit to the GP how much I drink at a weekend and benchmark it, then I can actually know what steps I might need to take. And I might know in general already, but actually it really helps, doesn't it, to have some measurements to help me take sensible action. I know where I sit, what my targets I'm comparing myself against, and then I can, in terms of my own health, drive that if I want to or not. And the same here for soils. So there was loads of research work, and there's continuing to be loads of research work in soils. And I'm not standing here telling you that everything is fixed, and I'm certainly not telling you that we know all the answers. But what we have, I think, as a result of the work that's been going on, is actually some really good general principles for maintaining and improving soil health. And many of those are things our grandfathers might have known. But we're rolling those forward and thinking about them and constantly going back and evaluating them in the context of the new things we know. It would not surprise our grandfathers to know that pH really matters, would it? But with that message is still not out there in terms of practice, in terms of that pH actually in soils and in grasslands particularly, operating at a level that optimises productivity, that allows good production of clovers within swards and so on. But it's also important that that site-to-site -site variability is something we can capture. Because actually, we need to not just give general information, because actually if I give you an average recommendation for something or other, the chances are that's not going to be right for you specifically in your place. So site-specific information and advice is needed, and actually often that's about good husbandry, not good management. I make the difference because I've tried managing my husband, and it really doesn't work. Husbandry is a, a management approach that is really aware of situational factors, that checks how grumpy he is before I give him a task to do. You know those kind of things. This is a relationship building thing. Farming is about relationships with land and animals and crops as much as it is about management principles. So we have a wheel that's in your, in your um, handouts, in your book, 
or in the book that you can go and download to be more exact. So I'm not going to go through it. Traditional, and um, to, to show it as a triangle, but we really liked this way of thinking about it, because this is, those of you who, who had children about 10 years ago, this is the finger spinner. Do you remember those? That children played with, and as you spun them around, they all merged into one. This isn't about biology, physics, or chemistry. It's about them being spun around. It's the interaction between them that gives us those healthy soils. And there are possible principles that underpin that optimum pH being one of them in terms of chemistry, really critical for good biology. Drainage, really critical that these organisms can breathe properly and have oxygen at the right time. But there are also those principles there that are directed at biology that we might think are more modern and trendy and possibly even regenerative if, we, if we're using that term today. This work was founded on some work that was done around healthy grassland soils and creating tools that farmers could use to make quick assessments themselves of how their soils were sitting, of how compact they were, to give them a score. And those of you who haven't accessed this fine leaflet really should have one in the back of your cab, ideally several places. Everywhere you have a spade, having this healthy grassland soils leaflet, not because of the side I'm showing you on the screen, but because of the other side that shows you some pictures and some tips on what to look for and how to score soils. Why does that matter? Because actually the physical outworking in terms of what we see is the closest we get to a single measure of soil health. And you all know that, or those of you who are farmers, certainly in the room, you can walk in a field, put a spade in the ground and know this one's better than that one. This one smells, this one's got big huge lumpy bits in it. This one, yep, we're taking those sorts of parameters but the evidence is really clear that farmers on farm assessment of this is as good as scientists. Every time we compare it, farmers do this as well as scientists. Why? Well, because scientists tend to get a bit disrupted by the minutiae of it. Oh, hang on, is that two centimetres of that or 20 centimetres? Oh, is it two point? It's two. It'll be fine. So we took a whole range of approaches that were to take the best possible science expert groups, people in the room, to try and talk around what was going on, to think about what we needed to know and how to make that. And we needed to think very carefully about how we were going to deliver the information. And we focused, and you've seen some of this on the screen already, because these are being, this, this is just sensible, I think, but being picked up and used by other people too, the idea of using traffic lights for signalling, the idea of giving categories and so on, taking the context of a soil type and then giving values for it. I'm just going to show you some draft metrics. So I said the work wasn't done in Northern Ireland, um, but we've taken some of the metrics and these actually were picked up and run into the soil health scheme. Um, these are organic matter metrics. Um, so across the line, so you can't see the numbers particularly well, but runs from naught to 20% organic matter. Low organic matter, we say that's red, that means there's probably a problem there, that's lower than we'd expect it to be for that soil type, it's really worth investigating why that isn't getting my head around it. Amber, that means that we just want to review that, is that something to do with something we already know about, it might be a long term management or so on. And then we get green and dark green in the terms of, of um, organic matter because there are soils that are holding more than the average. So the, the middle green is kind of where we'd expect to be in terms of average, and we have soils that are holding more than the average. Not currently in your Northern Ireland soil nutrient health scheme benchmarks, but for grassland, we recognize it is possible, usually for factors due to waterlogging or low pH, for soils to start to accumulate organic matter too much. As if I was talking to a farmer, we talk about thatch. That stuff on the top that's just not breaking down. So we go amber at the top here to say if you've got those sorts of really big numbers on what you expect to be a productive grassland soil, that's probably because something's not something else is not quite working. It doesn't mean it's wrong, it means it's worth reviewing. That's what those numbers at the top mean. So those metrics are being captured into the new guidance. I'm looking at Joanna, who's going to nod at me, to give me a new booklet that is specifically for Northern Ireland and benchmarking. So that we have a Scotland one, we have an England and Wales one, and there will very soon be a Northern Ireland, at least out for draft, for comment and, and review. So we took those benchmarks, those ways of thinking, to farmers. They'd been involved in helping us decide them. But we said, well, how's this going to work in practice? 
recognising that what we were after was not a tool that gave us all the answers, but that promoted understanding and discussion. Yeah, pharma conversation about numbers is more important than do this with the numbers. Promoting that, well, I still dream of the world in which a farmer enters a pub not saying, I got five tonnes per hectare, but saying, I've got 13 worms. <laughs> How can we help farmers engage with their soil health results? That's making them easy. That's unmystifying the soil health stuff. It's about, well, it's about red, ambers and greens, isn't it? Because that very quickly allows us to engage with the data. To do that work, we need to put it all together. That's going to mean something that's a little bit different than the way we had currently sampled soils. Because it isn't about a W walk across a field, because if I walk a W this week, and then I go back into the field, with my best intentions to work the same W, the chances are I won't. And then do is the, is the difference in my values because of my different walk or because of my difference in change in the soil properties. So too, if we're going to look at change through time, we have to do something a little bit different. And this is not rocket science. My phone, which this is not, but my phone lets me go back to pretty much the same place in a field. And we've taken an approach that basically says we're sampling within five metres of a geolocated point. I use what three words, I put my bucket down, there it is on the picture, and then I stay within five metres of it to sample. I can do that. The, the GPS wanders a little bit, but I'm, the five metres thing allows me to be able to go back to the same place. That doesn't mean I'm trying to capture a whole field then. What I'm saying is, is my management practice, as worked out in this particular place, having the effect I expect it to have? Yeah, I'm not trying to make a claim for a whole field. If I want to make a management decision for a field or a field zone, yeah, I'm going to have to go and take a really good representative soil sample. It could be a W, but S's and L's and all sorts of other letters work too to give me that representative soil sample for that zone or field. Linking biology, chemistry and physics. In this context, I'll show you the indicators. We chose, after a big screening program of 40-odd, to try and work out the ones that would work on form, give us reliable results and make sense. But that means a combination of in-field measurements and lab measurements. And we did that by going to a lot of long-term experiments. Lisa talked to you about how that, that's happened in Northern Ireland, the same thing in the U, in, across the water, um, so that we went to long-term experiments where we knew what the management changes were. We deliberately, this isn't, we didn't fall out of love with Rothamsted, but we deliberately went to ones that were close to the kind of practices that might still might actually be happening on farms currently. So, and we also had good data, or there was already good data in the literature from sites like those long-term experiments at Rothamsteads and ones we have at Saxmundham and other places too. So this was to farm scale, farm plot, normal applications, because we asked John, of, of um, green manures and composts and all sorts of other things too. So just to quickly show you a set of data that we collected, those of you who are quick have gone, well, that's interesting, look, control and then different kinds of organic matter additions. I don't have to try very hard to work out that adding organic materials to the soil makes my soil more green, or at least healthier in this context. The one row to look across is phosphorus. The scorecard picks up phosphorus and says if it gets too high, that's a risk to water. And we might want to review or investigate in a way that's thinking about that environmental context of that measurement. And hence, it picks up the kind of data, again, John was showing you earlier, of those very high numbers, meaning we need to think about those differently. That's actually a natural outcome of that underpinning soil type. It's a high phosphorus soil. There isn't a lot that we can do there, and if we want to add organic materials, we need to think about that very carefully. The additional measurement on there at the bottom for looking at microbial activity is the other one we evaluated for microbial activity, which there's lots of measures called PMN. This is an anaerobic incubation to look at microbial activity that we had a look at in that context. And that was interesting because it showed up a smaller impact of slurry than more well-composted materials on microbial activity. So that idea that does come through in other studies too, that well-composted, well-broken-down materials make microbes more happy and more active and supports their populations better than short-term applications of nutrients in high-density forms like slurry. 
And the question was, do we need more detailed indicators? I said I was going to talk about it a lot, but I think it's important to notice, so this is mesofauna data, the insects and communities, that we're now starting to get techniques. These were counted and looked at through microscopes, hugely complicated methodology, hugely expensive as a consequence, but it is possible to do that in a way now using AI to, to identify them. But notice here how much site splits these data. So these are the kind of cluster plots. Lisa was showing you all the treatments at Crabston tend to cluster together and all the treatments at Harper Adams tended to cluster together and there were much bigger differences between sites than there were between treatments. This is a problem when we're trying to understand and pick out general principles for soil health because site impacts are huge. Those nasty geology and climate variables change how our organisms and interactions work. But we really wanted to target bringing that soil health to life, making this real, making it practical on farm. And there's nothing better, it has to be said, on a field walk than getting a spade out. I've even proved that in Northern Ireland for creating some interest and some conversations around what's going on. So, for example, Monitor Farm, I haven't got the Northern Ireland Monitor Farm data because it wasn't me that did it, it was a colleague. But this is a Nor um, Norfolk Monitor Farm where we did six sites doing different things through the rotation. These are nothing like many Northern Irish soils, given the pHs are all in the eights. But nonetheless, just to give you, okay, there's a snapshot here. What we did then with that data, because we had the data, was zoom in. So we didn't just say the ordinary scorecard's enough. We zoomed in to have a look at some of the more detailed parameters we could around soil organic matter. And for some of those, it's possible to get benchmarks too. That organic matter to clay ratio can be really important in understanding the ability of the soil to hold on to and stabilize organic matter. Something that actually the scorecard doesn't stop us adding new indicators as they become available. It just acts as a really good baseline against which those new indicators can be fitted and set. More importantly than those numbers, I would say every time, is that visual assessment of soil structure. And for me, it's a picture that goes with the observation in the field. So those got given numbers, they get given scores, but the pictures are much better and much more useful than the scores. Another great reason to have my phone with me when I'm doing soil sampling, even if it's raining, to make sure, again, I scale those. You, I tend to use a bit of um, old exhibition board or a fertilizer sack that I've washed out, turned in, you know, like, you know what I mean, to give me a background. I've got my spade in there for scale. I can see what's going on. So if we work left to right across that screen, this is a sandy soil, it's got irrigation available, of course they're going to grow potatoes on it, um, that's what the soil looks like after potatoes. It's not great. It's blocky. You're all going to tell me that's not great. It's not awful, because actually this is a sandy soil that breaks open really easily. But equally, it's got, well, it's got the same organic matter, hang on a minute, as that lay next door. So actually, interestingly, got a little bit more clay than the, the lay next door and is probably why those two are the same organic matter. If we look at the microbial activity here using the CO2 burst, difficult to interpret in these very high pH soils, so don't be put off by those very low numbers. That's an artifact of the methodology. But we've got that lowest where we've got the most hammer working up through. And we can see, I think, that we'd probably all be happy if we got the soil on the far right-hand side. If I had to give you one of those three, I think you'd all be voting for that one. Bit higher organic matter, not a huge difference, but also that structure and clustering of the soils working too. What the scorecard lets us do then is not get all the answers, but starts a conversation. And as I say, with cluster groups, this is data from potato growers across the UK, letting us have conversations about soil in a different way, opening up for us to talk about management and the impact of management practices in a different way. There's a whole load of great resources. As a result, I'm just going to direct you to a couple that weren't on the slide at the beginning, measuring and managing soil organic matter, improving soil for better returns if you're a grassland farmer, and also to direct you to a range of resources that the UK Soil Health Initiative put together, and that was me arm wrestling an awful lot of people, not quite as many as in this room, into a room to have a conversation about what kind of information, what made good practice, what made bad practice. And we've done that across a range of farm types. Because again, the right advice for someone growing potatoes is not the same advice as someone on a lowland livestock farm. It's about thinking about how it fits into your system and how to manage it. So those are system-specific leaflets that are available. 
I'm going to shut up, but thank you for having me. It's been great to be with you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And I think what you said is, is true. You, you actually do bring soil health to life. And actually seeing those applications out in the field that um, uh, farmers and growers can actually understand and act on is really, really important. So I think we maybe have time for a couple of questions. Do we have any questions for Elizabeth? And maybe have have a question. You know, we, we, we've sort of started um, looking at how we um, replicate this for Northern Ireland. And just to um, maybe pose the question, it is an iterative process. It's going to be a bit more to and fro. Yeah, I, I think I think we're close, Joanna, in terms of being able to put out the book for consultation. I think we're ridiculously close, actually. I think that you guys have some really interesting data on the Solvita, on that CO2 burst, that we did some really was one of the innovation fund projects as part of soil biology and health to look at those indicators. That project changed the way they're interpreted in England. Or well, if you send your samples to Yara or to NRM, they now use the benchmarks that were developed by soil biology and health. But actually, with the data Paul's looking at, looking at those Solvita data in the context of the CNN pools in the soil, looks like it's pulling out something equally and perhaps even more interesting. So where you are, where people are getting more data collected, that might give us more, even more tools for interpretation. I think that's really exciting. And I think that's what's really great, is that the iterative process here adds in and doesn't get rid of something that went before, but builds on it and enhances it so that there's an immediately accessible piece and there's the piece that then is going on and developing. And science doesn't junk our understanding of pH when we get excited about soil biology. It needs to capture that and move on with it, but add those things in as it goes while staying um, interactive and available. And yeah, I'm, we're really looking forward to that. But do keep an eye open. It's, I'm guessing, minutes away from coming through. I'm not going to make since Joanna co commit. But to, to start to use it, you won't be surprised at what those benchmarks are. PK benchmarks are RB209 standards. They're, they're, they're very sensible things that we're picking and using. It's just really interesting to start to do that. And one of the things Joanna has done, I think, brilliantly is take what is a written down book and make it into an Excel spreadsheet that means you can type your data in and it gives you your scorecard. And it gives you your scorecard in a way you can copy it, save it, and then keep your scorecard as a reference to go forward. Thank you. I think it'd be really interesting to see as well how that um, develops alongside the Soil and Engineering Health Scheme. So, um, thank you, Elizabeth. Great talk. Um, I'm going to move on to the next talker, and our next talker is Paul, who's actually been working with Joanna and Joe Bartlett on um, the uh, Soil Health Scorecard. <laughs> Um, so, Paul, Col Paul Cotney works at Africa Cross and Creevy with myself, and he's the project leader for grass and cereal variety performance. So, we are very much all about plants and soil. Um, Paul's PhD was looking at soil health, cover cropping, and his research interests um, include that as well as novel crops. And um, I'm going to hand over to Paul, whose talk is. Apologies. Paul's going to tell you what the talk is. I'll tell, I'll tell you, no, that's fine. <laughs> thank so, you, Paul. So it's just, perfect, thank yeah. you very much. Is it up? Oh. Good afternoon. My talk today is on soil health and arable, and I'll be focusing on some of the biological aspects of that and the measurements. <clears throat> so hopefully you can all hear me. But just to give it a bit of an overview of arable in Northern Ireland then, in the 1850s, there was over 400,000 hectares of total crops. However, today, this is around 46,000 hectares. This decline is attributed to the phasing out of the horse, meaning less reliance on the oats, less reliance on potatoes, and also intensification of uh, livestock farms requiring more grass. Um, whilst grassland is better at sequestering carbon, Alarable does have considerable benefits, and I do believe that it will grow in the future for numerous reasons, and also for better integration of whole crops as well in their use on livestock farms. The benefits of Arable then include well, the produce directly offsets imported feeds. In 2019, there was 200,000 tonnes of total cereals produced locally, representing about 6.5% self-sufficiency. And the benefits of this means it directly reduces importation of nitrogen and phosphorus. As you heard earlier about the phosphorus overloads in Northern Ireland. In addition, when these grains and also forages are fed through, the arable land acts as a sink for organic manures from, from livestock enterprises. 
and arable cropping predominantly occurs in mixed farms. And the benefit of this is it reduces the food miles that feed has to travel. And in addition, uh, Northern Irish farmers usually get a higher price than that of mainland Britain because they don't have to import the feed. They save on that. Another benefit is that the arable industry plays a key role in providing a bedding, bedding material where there is considerable amount of straw imported out of uh, Ireland and also mainland Great Britain, again reducing those miles. And also the cropping and arable provide landscape scale diversity, which that the grassland can't. So what is good soil health in arable? We all know that soil health depends on these three pillars. But what does it mean to land, land users of uh, the arable industry? Well, it means soil carbon is maintained. Soil fertility, structure and biology are maintained or enhanced. And it means an increased resilience with better yield stability whilst using less. So it's about efficiency, but also a resilience in climate uh, conditions such as droughts or excess rain, as you've heard about the bounce back from Suzanne about the soil. However, in arable production, there are considerable challenges, which predominantly are intensive tillage. So we usually rely on the plough and power harrow, which does a great job at making a seed bed. However, it is intensive in terms of um, the mixing of the soil, and it can increase the breakdown of carbon. In addition, that structure that has been created can be more vulnerable to compaction, as you've seen from Marcello's work. And in, in Northern Ireland, there is a limited diversity of rotations. This is due to weather and climate. The weather limits the amount of, uh, sorry, weather and scale. The weather limits the number of crops that we can grow, and scale means sometimes there's not the markets developed for those other crops. It was warmly welcomed in the last three years, the protein incentive scheme, and farmers, despite it giving a profitable uh, new crop for farmers, it also meant that farmers could actually start to understand the effects of some of these non, uh, newer break crops, or not newer, but more able to be inter integrated, such as beans, their effects on soil structure and legacy effects on nitrogen as well. In arable production then, there is extended periods of fallow, where fallow is where the time interval from when one crop is harvested and the next planted. And typically this fallow has low soil cover which means it's exposed to elements, especially on a day like today with high rainfall and the impacts from that. There's also in arable quite low organic matter input because when grains are removed and also the straw, the residue from the stubbles is quite low and does not continue to grow. However, there are mitigation strategies. We start off with simple ones like soil pH, but like as you've heard today, pHs are not as where they should be on uh, farms. Organic manures, cover crops, incorporation of straw, improving rotations, and low disturbance tillage. The suitability of these different strategies depends on farm structure and region. As I said and before, the straw is a considerable bedding material, so that's where incorporation of straw is less likely to happen in Northern Ireland due to the value of straw. Improving rotations can be troublesome, uh, especially because of the weather and climate in Northern Ireland, but doable potentially through more use of whole crops and potentially intercropping to produce energy and protein feeds for the ruminant industry. Low disturbance tillage or direct drilling is an excellent mitigation strategy. For in order this to this, for this to be successful means that the land user has to be paying attention to all the previous mitigation strategies. The only issue with this in Northern Ireland is the ability to take this up due to it's not a weatherproof system because we get a considerable amount of rain and also sometimes the scale as well means that the costs go up and we can't use that. For today's talk, I'm going to talk about um, a lot of the research that AFPI have been doing on the mitigation strategies such as soil pH, organic manures, cover crops, and take a focus on soil biology. So soil pH then. We all know about soil pH and nutrient availability, but what about its impact on our muscular mycorrhizae fungi? What are these? These are fungi which infect the plant to produce hyphae and allow the plant to explore a lot more soil and then for return for, for, for carbon. The host plant receives an improved tolerance to stress such as in salinity or as in drought as it improves uptake of water, can improve the mobilization and acquisition of nutrients 
listed there, such as specifically phosphorus, can improve with cephalogen suppression and improve soil structure in the long term through the release of glomulin, which acts as a glue to bind together soil into aggregates. What we found was that when soil pH increased, as did the recovery of the arbuscular mycorrhizae fungi. So there is a significant correlation there. And as pH increases, then we're getting a beneficial effect. Likewise, with the Solvita CO2 method, we got a significant correlation as soil pH increased, the value increased. This method is where dried, sieved soil is exposed to water for a set period of time with carbon flux measured. And basically, the, ben the more higher the value, the more benefit of the benefit because this method is correlated to soil carbon and it's soil correlated to soil nitrogen. The next mitigation strategy then is organic manures. And the findings that I'll be showing you in the next slide are based on a comms experiment set up in Cross the Creevy in 2012. It is a continuous spring barley crop which received the different treatments of cattle, pig and digestate slurries with a control on different rates of nitrogen. The different measurements we made then include earthworm biomass, earthworm count, beta glucosidase, soil microbial biomass, and the Sylveda CO2. However, after it was in this case four year trial years of application, the only metric that we find any statistical differences in was the Sylveda, whereby those plots which were receiving organic manure, such as pig, dairy, and digestate, has a, had a significantly higher Sylveda value than that of the inorganic, or which is just standard MPK fertilizers, and that of the control, therefore showing the benefit. But again, this does take time. The findings from this trial then went on to inform the manure and arable trial, which is a three-year trial and in its concluding stage where we integrated a lot more organic manures, some of which in the orange are pretty standard, but the ones in the green then are more novel, as Suzanne had said about the different broiler litter pellets and different treatments as well. Next mitigation strategy then is use of cover crops. Um, what are cover crops? These are species of plant, plants which are sown as opposed to leaving land fallow. They are not harvested, which means they are returned back into the soil as an investment into soil health. What does a typical spring barley rotation look like, or a spring crop in that fact? Well, in Northern Ireland, there's usually about 13,000 hectares of spring barley. This crop is harvested last week of, usually harvested last week of August, first week of September, not this year, and planted again in April. So that leaves over the winter very, very exposed to um, heavy rainfall. And I think that picture is a fairly typical uh, and accurate picture of what, what we'd see today in a stubble field. So by incorporating cover crop, you can, can protect that soil through providing a physical armor. So our question then in the project was, can a cover crop be successfully incorporated here to provide benefits? And what were those, some of those benefits? What we found, was the main benefit from cover crops in Northern Ireland was the nutrient sequestration. There was weed suppression, ability to improve soil structure. As you can see on the right hand side of that picture, that is tillage radish, which produces a deep taproot, and this can grow through some of the more compacted soil. Whereas Basilia on the left hand side produces an extensive root system and can loosen the soil. They also aim to diversify rotations through when you integrate. Um, non uh, different families to, of species to what you're normally growing. You provide over winter fodder and in the long term can improve soil organic matter. They provide environmental benefits such as protection against soil erosion. As I said, they act as a physical armor to dissipate the energy from the rain. As Marcello had said, the soil the erosivity of this of rainfall is going to increase in the future and these are key things which can be in, integrated and improve. Overall, they can improve soil health then. So, in terms of soil biology then, we looked at my soil microbial biomass with the different species down the right hand side. 
with and without slurry. However, we did not find any statistical differences, but this was measured during the growth of the, of the cover crop and does not take into account the uh, incorporation of that carbon back into the soil. In addition, that was made six months after they were sown, so it was quite uh, ambitious to see a change. As we are seeing today, it does take long-term impacts. But the main benefit of cover crops then were their ability to be a biofertilizer. A biofertilizer is one that it returns macronutrients, micronutrients, and also carbon. Carbon accumulation and return to soil is considerable by cover crops. Each graph here represents two different years, and the differences in the amount being accumulated is primarily due to delayed sowing. Um, as you can see, the graph on the left end was sown on the 14th of August. Um, that's the right, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and then the next one was sown the 7th of September. Early sowing is key to the success of a cover crop to get that biomass growth and that nu nutrient acquisition. The forage rate then in 2019 was able to accumulate over two ton to the hectare of carbon, whereas in the second year it was a ton to the hectare. But it's the control or the fallow that we want to look at for its carbon return. In the first year then, it was just shy of a ton to the hectare, which, is about, uh, which was a considerable weed growth and return of carbon. However, in the second year, there was no weeds grew and therefore no, no carbon being returned back to soil. As I said, the nutrient sequestration of the cover crops was the most important benefit from them, and it is considerable. The amount of nitrogen that they can accumulate is incredible. This experiment invest, used three different sowing dates in the aim to try and find species which were better suited to those different sowing dates. The date of 14th of August then was used to, in court to uh, simulate a crop, say, coming out of winter barley into spring barley but yet that doesn't encompass that many rotations. So that's why that is a delayed sowing, such as the 7th September, where typically spring barley would be harvested, or the latest one in September then, which would mop up a lot more rotations and try to increase the amount of area sown to cover crops. The, forage, or the tillage radish and forage rape managed to accumulate over 260 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare in when it was already sown. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, a spring barley crop, or spring crop in general, usually requires 140 kilograms of nitrogen. So we're almost able to accumulate double what a spring crop actually requires. When moving on to the 7th of September then, the species uh, order stayed the same there, but it was under delayed sowing that there was a clear change in the species and their ability to cope with that delayed sowing. Vesalia accumulated 70 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, and presented considerable growth, where some of those other species, such as forage rape, which were very suitable earlier, were completely decimated by um, pigeons and therefore unsuitable. But again, it, it is uh, looking at the control or the fallow is the most important thing there, because that is the difference between what um, nitrogen can actually be retained into the system. And that can be in excess of 200 kilos there. So just to conclude then, Soil pH influences soil biology. It takes repeat applications of organic manures to improve soil respiration. And the main function of cover crops is to return carbon and act as a biofertilizer. More research is required in impact rotations and reducing tillage. And overall, to improve soil biology takes time continuous best practice. I'd just like to acknowledge Deere for their funding. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, a bit of a change of tack there, but it's really good to see the uh, influence of cropping on soil health and, and use of cover crops. Um, if, does anybody have a question for Paul? Over here. Yep. Um, I just wanted to ask you about you know, cover crops. That's the end point. You did mention this, one of the main, main things um, as well, because some um, research that was done on a farm in Northern Ireland is part of the DHB uh, monitoring farm was that he found it's the end point that kind of locked up the nitrogen. So when he put the crop in, the nitrogen wasn't, it was there, but it wasn't available to the crop that year. It was neither the second year. So depending on when you end the cover crop, it was 
positive or, or, or negative. So just if you looked into that. Yeah, so to try, and, yep. to try and work out the nitrogen availability from cover crops is incredibly different because there's so much noise, there's so many factors, such as, as you say, endpoint, but also um, species. But with regards to endpoint, you want to try and get that plant to incorporated back or destroyed before it actually gets very stemmy. It's the same thing as grass. As grass gets stemmy, it gets less, uh, it's harder to break down. So that's one part of it. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, mm -hmm. Fiona. <laughs> So your cover crops are always growing during the winter time. Is there any, do you look for crops that are slow growing or have you any issue with them bolting? You know, we were getting our weird, warm, tropical Septembers now time. Say that again, sorry. Do you know, we were getting tropical yeah. Septembers. Do you have an issue with them bolting on that? Um, it depends on the species used. Mustards and things like that there would be t uh, typical to do that. But the tillage radish uh, forage rape needs a frost actually to put before it would even flower. So, um, Species choice can overcome that. That is one one factor we did look at because, again, you don't want to set seed either from these things. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe time for one more quick question if anyone has one. I don't see any hands up. I, w I would just like to maybe pose the question because I know, um, you know, there's been a big push with you working with Caffrey, for example, trying to promote the, the adoption of cover mm -hmm. crops. Um, what do you think the barriers are that? for that in, in Northern Ireland? I think the primary barrier is weather. You know, we, we all are, are trying to aim to do our best and that can uh, influence things, but I do believe the impact of subsidies could help assist farmers to see the benefits of it. As in Ireland, which under that glass scheme, the effect of the subsidies there incentivizing the cover crops was that even once the subsidies were removed, over 60% of the farmers would con continue to grow the cover crops, which meant that they were observing the benefits from that. And from that, it is the long-term impacts of what you actually learn, what you're questioning of nitrogen breakdown, what your crop needs. It is, the value of the cover crops is more over actually what you learn from that practice. Yeah, so I'd like a lot of measures to improve soil health, it takes time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. So our next speaker is Archie. So Archie has changed his title to a very long one. It's now called Safeguarding the Ecosystem Services Provided by Earthworms to Northern Ireland Grass and Crop Production. And before Archie takes the microphone, I'm going to just say that Archie um, works in AFPI. <laughs> and he attained his PhD in 1997 at Rothamsted, so some nice links there. Um, Archie's research is concerned with surveillance and monitoring of pests and the use of functional biodiversity in sustainable agriculture production. And there's a lot of other um, things, but Archie's going to talk now about earthworms, so thank you very much, Archie. Good. Um, thanks, Lisa. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, I'm just going to give a, a quick overview um, of earthworms and some of the work uh, we did in AFBE. So, uh, yeah, it's the title of my talk is going to do with earthworm ecosystem services and some of the, the threats and also the things that enhance populations. So uh, 142 years ago, uh, Charles Darwin wrote a book on the formation of vegetable mould through the action of worms. And uh, it's traditional to open earthworm talks with a quote like this. So the plough is one of the most ancient and most valuable of man's inventions. But long before he existed, the land was in fact regularly ploughed and still continues to be thus ploughed by earthworms. It may be doubted whether there are many other animals which have played so important a part in the history of the world as have these lowly organized creatures. So I'm just going to relate um, back to what John mentioned in terms of the amount of manure that's produced. Um, so we have quite an intensive livestock production in Northern Ireland. I think we have uh, potentially one of the highest, if not the highest, densities of cattle in Europe, about 118 per square kilometre. 80% of farmed, grass is grand, uh, farmed land is grass, and the uh, livestock sector produces 9.7 million tonnes of animal manure each year. 
and that manure has to go somewhere and it has to be processed through the soil. And earthworms play an important role in that processing. So this is just a, a list of the earthworm ecosystem services. Uh, so first off is, is waste recycling. So this is the soil process of decomposition. So earthworms break down dead plant material, dung and slurry through their feeding. And also by moving through the soil and releasing their, their cast, their feces, they help to incorporate um, the said material into the soil. And they're working very closely with microorganisms. So the, the first step is really the fragmentation of the material by earthworms. And then this increases the surface area, which allows the microorganisms to feed and to release the nutrients further. So the second uh, ecosystem service is carbon and nutrient regulation. So this is really nutrient cycling, so release of nitrogen in the cast. Uh, nutrient transformation, making it more available to plants. And again, very much closely associated uh, with microorganisms and how the microorganisms are uh, recycling nutrients as well. And then slightly differently, we have uh, water flow regulation. Um, so this is uh, earthworms by their burrowing activities, they create channels in the soil. And these channels are important uh, for the transit of both water and air into the soil. And lastly, soil structure maintenance. And earthworms form uh, or aid in the formation of soil aggregates. And this is through the excretion of mucus and also in their casts. And these aggregates, aggregate, soil aggregates are important for keeping the soil friable and keeping it open. So we normally have uh, between 200 to 600 earthworms per square metre. Uh, this is just from our field sites in Northern Ireland. Uh, this data is, is probably about 20, uh, 20 years old now, uh, maybe a bit older. Um, but it, it does show the density of earthworms uh, in the fields and how it varies from one field to another. Um, we haven't looked at that in sufficient detail to give you a reason why it varies, um, but you know, seeing some of the talks earlier um, you know, from Suzanne and Rachel, um, I think it's something we, we could do uh, at least um, in a preliminary stage and uh, try and work out why there's that very fine spatial variation. Um, what we have done, though, is map this distribution at a Europe-wide scale. So we contributed the data to a mapping um, of earthworms across Europe. And you can see that paper to the right um, of the screen. And that's largely driven um, by climate and also by soil type. Um, so we haven't looked in any great detail at management practices there. So um, there are different earthworms. Um, in our surveys in grassland fields, we have found 14 species. Um, there was about six or seven common species, uh, and I've listed a few of the main ones here. They're divided up into, well, traditionally divided up into different earthworm ecotypes, although there's quite a, a bit of debate in the literature about exactly how this works and how you associate earthworms into these particular niches. So um, I say the traditional way is to refer to epigeic earthworms. These live at the soil surface and are really litter feeders. Um, so they are responding very much to manure when it's, it's um, applied to the fields. Then we have the deep vertical burrowers, the anisic earthworms. And these form, uh, say, vertical uh, semi-permanent burrows. And they're very important in terms of, of uh, soil drainage and water infiltration. And then another common species is Alabophila colorotica, which is the green earthworm. And it's a bit sort of half and half between epigeic and endogeic species. And I'll mention it later uh, if you just remember that point. And lastly, there are the subsurface sort of burrowers, the uh, endogeic species. And the main one that we would find would be Aporectidea collaginosa. So just to show a graphic of, of how uh, this um, this sort of work. So we can see at the, the close to the surface, we have the, the litter dwellers, the epigeic species. And then we have the, uh, the vertical burrowers, um, which are, are the likes of Lumbicus terrestris. And can see how the water is filtered into the soil um, through these burrows. 
And then we have the, the subsurface uh, feeders, which are, are feeding just in horizontal, uh, sort of non-permanent burrows. Value in earthworms, um, the data is a little bit old, um, but there was a very important paper published um, in 2014, which was a meta-analysis of the contribution of earthworms to plant growth. And from a, an agricultural perspective, um, what the figure they came up with for ryegrass production was that earthworms were contributing about 34% of above-ground biomass um, production. And if you, if you go through the figures, uh, we can put a value in that. Uh, I say it's very rough, and it's a back of an envelope sort of job of about 83 million uh, per annum contribution of earthworms um, to agriculture. So we, we should value the soil. The soil is a tremendous asset, as other speakers have said. But we should also value uh, the organisms that live in the soil as well, not taken for granted. So the long-term uh, slurry plots have been mentioned um, by Lisa, uh, dating back to the 1970s. And uh, there are eight treatments applied to 30 metre square plots of an established ryegrass sward. And these treatments are an unfertilised control, a fertilised control with synthetic fertilisers, and then uh, pig slurry at three rates and cattle slurry at three rates. Um, so a few years ago, um, we sampled earthworms on these plots over three years um, to see what the effect of the, the slurry was. So this is just um, the results. Uh, so uh, say we sampled over three years and we sampled at, at different times during the three years. And so along the um, x-axis we have the treatments. In some cases, because of the statistics, the treatments are grouped. So that's why uh, not all treatments are given uh, for each of the sampling occasions. And then up the y-axis is uh, the, the, the weight, the earthworm biomass. Um, we tend to use earthworm biomass rather than number because you saw the variation in the size of the earthworms. So a large uh, Lumbacus terrestris, for example, can be 10 times the size of, of an Aparectidia collagenosa. So we tend to use biomass. So the results are, um, in the first sampling period, uh, we found that there was a significant difference uh, really driven by the inorganic fertilizer. And then when we moved on to the second sampling period in May, uh, we saw that the earthworm reproduction is sort of kicking in as you go into the spring, and they're responding to the slurry. Uh, so responded to the cattle slurry, but not to the pig slurry. And then the final uh, graph here, taken from October, is where we have the largest uh, earthworm biomass. And in this case, the response is uh, significant in the, the low slurry plots. Um, and, and this is probably driven uh, by the presence of the, the larger anisic earthworms, uh, Lumbacus terrestris. So they are not responding to the, so much to the high slurry dose, but rather to the, the lower dose. And if I bring up the next slide, I can look at this in, in a little bit more detail. Um, really what I'm driving at here is the individual responses of the earthworm species rather than an overall earthworm response. So this is a principal components analysis, and it's just a statistical technique of looking at how to cluster the data and to look for associations. So um, we have, first of all, the control plots, which are these ones um, with the open circles. And then the ones in blue are uh, the fertilizer, synthetic fertilizer plots. And then that one that's just come up, the shaded one, is the high pig slurry. And I'm just going to bring up one more, which is the high cow slurry. So you can see that they are separating out uh, according to how the earthworms are responding to them. Um, so you can see that the, 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 uh, the high, high slurry plots is quite separate. The, the control and the uh, pig slurry plots are, are pretty much grouped together. I'm not seeing much difference there compared to control. If we then look at the species associations, we can see these arrows represent the association and the strength of the association. 
So you can see that the epigeic species are very much associated with the, the slurry plots, the cow slurry plots, okay, and the arrow direction towards them, and to a lesser extent, the anisic species. On the other hand, oh sorry, just to say that Lumbricus rubellus, which is this litter-dwelling compost feeder, is most closely, is five times greater in the high cow slurry plots than in the controls. So very much responding to this injection of food. If we then look at the endogeic species, so these are the, the subsurface um, feeders, they're actually responding much more um, to the synthetic uh, fertilizer application. You can see they're directed towards the left-hand side of the principal components uh, plot. The exception to that is the species that I mentioned earlier. It's about half and half, Allobophila chlorotica, uh, which is more associated in this case, is behaving more like a, a litter feeding earthworm. So it's just showing them all together. Um, now, I, I hope you'll indulge me, um, but I, I can't talk about earthworms in Northern Ireland uh, without referring to the New Zealand flatworm. Um, this is a predatory invasive species that came into Northern Ireland in the 1960s, and it, it's an obligate predator of, of earthworms. So it, it's one of the, a sort of ongoing topic of our research uh, down the years. Uh, we do have some native flatworm species, um, these little microplana species here up to the, the top right of the slide, um, but you can see they're much smaller than the invasive species, uh, which can fully extend and can be about 20 centimetres in length. It feeds on earthworms, um, so it wraps itself, well, it, it potentially has a neurotoxin, the flatworm, um, so it will dull down the earthworms, stop them writhing around, wrap themselves around it, and then it releases digestive enzymes, and you can see that the, the earthworm tissues are starting to break down. And it's now listed as um, uh, an EU um, invasive species of union concern. So we did some work looking at the impact of the flatworm on earthworms. And uh, when we have a density of 0.8 flatworms per square meter, which is what we've actually found in the field, um, in, in you know, farmers' fields, uh, we saw a 20% reduction in earthworm biomass. Uh, but most importantly, uh, the issue that's probably causing us com some concern is the one that's shown in the graph here, is where you have a very strong negative relationship between presence of the flatworm and these anisic earthworms, these vertical burrowers, and where you have um, a 20% reduction in overall earthworm biomass, you have a 75% reduction in the anisic biomass. And I say, if you extrapolate that graph down, you can see that once you get beyond one to two flatworms per square meter, uh, the anisic uh, earthworms are, are really suffering. Um, now it's, it's interesting, uh, I say, one of the, the, the things that isn't maybe mentioned so much in this is that when we see a reduction in the anisic earthworms, some of the other earthworms, their populations actually increase slightly. So there is competition within earthworms uh, within the soil. So just to, to finish up, uh, the take home messages that earthworms are a dominant soil fauna in Irish agriculture. Earthworm populations consist of several common species existing in different niches, but which interact in the soil. Um, sometimes they're associated with each other, sometimes they're in competition. Earthworm feeding and burrowing activities recycle nutrients, aerate and drain the soil, and drive microbial uh, decomposition. And this has uh, a major influence on crop yield. Application of organic manures, including slurry, and even inorganic fertilizers, is beneficial to earthworm populations. So basically, the more nutrients that go into the soil, the more food there is for the earthworms, and that's sort of driving their, their presence. Um, soil tillage I haven't touched on, but um, tillage uh, is damaging to earthworms uh, and also the invasive uh, New Zealand flatworm. And lastly, intercropping and multi-species swords can enhance earthworm populations. And John will be talking about that um, in a little bit. And just to give a plug uh, for the, the long-term slurry plot experiment, um, that work was done a few years ago. Uh, there's an update in the posters um, where the, there has been a slight change. They've incorporated uh, multi-species swords, and you can see a fact of that in earthworms. And also, uh, the effect of 
potential effect of copper, which is a bit of a contaminant in the pig slurry, and that's maybe the reason why um, earthworms are not responding so much uh, to the pig slurry. Um, just, just finish up with acknowledgements. I'd like to uh, acknowledge DIRA uh, for supporting um, the research that we've done uh, down the years. I'd also like to pay homage uh, to Professor Rod Blackshaw, um, who did an awful lot of work on earthworms and on flatworms, and he started off a lot of that work, and um, who sadly passed away in, in August. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Archie. It's, it's really nice to see a different flavour to our talks um, this afternoon. So, um, does anybody have any questions for Archie? Well, there's one over here, Hazel. Thanks. Once again, this is more of an observation than a question, but uh, we've been doing some preliminary work on earthworm sampling across a different land use types, and we're finding zero earthworms in woodland, uh, very reduced populations in silver pasture, and in old uh, matted um, sort of hay meadow type grassland, virtually no earthworms there either. Uh, mm. And I wonder, I mean, you know, it's great to, be think, to think that this might be a really useful indicator of soil health, but one has to be very careful that one limits that to certain types of, yeah. of soil and, and doesn't try to extrapolate it beyond that to other uh, land uses. And I think, uh, you know, for grassland particularly, it's very valuable, but for beyond that, I would be very hesitant to, to think of, uh, that we would you want to use it as an indicator of soil health. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. I mean, that was, um, that was the original title of the talk that Lisa <laughs> gave me, uh, was to look at earthworms as soil indicators. And uh, it's not something I worked on directly. But yeah, um, it, it's, um, it's exactly as you say. You know, different soil types um, you know, are going to have different different fauna, um, so we, we, we maybe need a, a broader classification, uh, and you're looking at the mites, the calembola, mm -hmm. all the other, um, you know, that Elizabeth mentioned, the, the mesofauna. Um, you know, I think, I think earthworms are part of that, certainly. Um, they're hugely valuable, and um, we need to understand more about what the individual species do in order to, to come up with a, a suitable sort of bioindicator for soil health. Um, because in, some species are purely responding to the, the nutrient inputs, and if they're living at the surface, they're not living necessarily uh, deep in the soil. So, yeah, I, I, I agree, and I think it, I say it probably needs a lot more work um, to be taken forward. Another question? Um, I would have liked to see a study done as well in another slurry context. So we've no origin info there on, on where that slurry came from. Um, and I'm thinking of uh, the wormers that we use, you know, our, our mectins that we put into our cattle and oh, yes. pigs and sheep. Yeah. So it would be so interesting if there was another study done where the slurry was taken from a system that was zero worming system. Yeah. Just to see the implication of that. Yeah, I, I think, um, not something I've looked at directly, I think the impact, well actually I, I've looked at it in a slightly different context. Um, we. Um, we looked. Um, we had some work on biting midges, and we uh, looked at dosing the cattle, and then looked at the dung and the, the, the midges coming out of the dung. I think the impact of the likes of the, the ivermectins, etc., the worming um, chemicals, it is, from what I can understand, more on the arthropod fauna than on the earthworms. I think the earthworms they come in at a later stage. But certainly things like dung beetles, a lot of work looking at the effect of, of you know, chem chemicals on, on dung beetles in particular. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's something that I say we've looked at in a slightly different context. And I, I don't know if we actually saw much difference in our experiments. Um, but uh, I need to revisit that, to be honest. Okay. Um, anybody else got a question? If, if not, we can move on to our... Final talk. Thank you very much, Archie. Thanks. Yeah. So. So last but certainly not least is John Finn, and John Finn joins us from Chagas. John is a farmland ecologist um, and works at the Chagas Environment Centre, 
and his research interests include design of multi-species uh, mixtures, low nitrogen and climate resilient farming systems. And John's going to talk about um, some results from the multi-species sward uh, work he's been involved in. Thanks, John. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, uh, <clears throat> my ears pricked when Archie mentioned dung beetles. I did my PhD on dung beetles about 30 years ago, and they never leave your heart. <laughs> um, I want to talk today about multi-species swords, and uh, first of all, thank you to AFPI for the invitation to be here. And uh, Fiona Brennan sends her apologies that she can't be here, and I hope I do a good job instead. Um, I'm a, a farmland ecologist working at Johnstown Castle, where half my time is on biodiversity, but about the other half, uh, a lot of the other half, if that makes sense, is uh, spent on, on multi-species swords. Uh, I usually talk about yield and forage quality, but today I'm going to uh, just share some of the insights from our work that are more directly related to soil and soil processes, but I am going to squeeze in a little bit of yield as well. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, drought resilience, uh, soil legacy effects, nitrous oxide emissions, and soil biodiversity. Uh, I'll start with an acknowledgement, and particularly of uh, the DAFM and DERA joint funding of the multi More project, which is allowing our FB colleague uh, Suzanne and our PhD researcher Daniel Varley uh, to be collaborators with us on a project with Chagas UCD, TCD and AFP, as well as uh, some other EU projects and the Chagas Walsh Scholarship Programme. So I'm going to use this little map throughout to indicate where I'm going in the talk, and I want to start with the biotic and abiotic influences of soil on yield, and in particular on drought resilience. Um, this is some work by colleagues in uh, Agroscope in Switzerland. And of course, one of the most important soil uh, processes that occur in multi-species wards is, soil biolog is biological nitrogen fixation. So this action by rhizobia in the soil nodules of the uh, clovers is extremely important in, in driving a synergistic relationship between grasses and legumes, and it re resulting in high quality, highly digestible, and lots of it, of yield. So in this graph, on the left-hand side, uh, we've on the y-axis is yield, on the x-axis is the proportion of legumes. So on the left-hand side of this graph, you've got the points above it are reflecting grass-only plots. And as you move across the, to the right-hand side, the proportion of grass in the mixture is reducing, and the proportion of clover in the mixture is increasing, so that you get a monoculture of clover on the right-hand side. And the three curves that you see here are reflecting experimental plots that received 50, 150, and an astronomical 450 kilos of nitrogen per annum as, of course, a very high nitrogen application for experimental purposes. So we can definitely say at nitrogen 450, nitrogen is not a limiting factor, okay? Um, the, the really interesting thing here is that if there was no synergistic interaction, you would expect as you go from, you know, uh, grasses dominating to uh, legumes dominating, you'd have this straight line relationship. But instead, we have this really huge bonus of a kick in yield due to the synergistic relationship and the extra nitrogen brought into the system by the clover. And just for now, I want to point out, in this example where we've got the grass only 450 kilos uh, level, by manipulating clover proportion at only 50 kilos of nitrogen, you can exceed the yields from grass with 450 kgs. So this is a really important soil-based process and drives a lot of the multi-species research and the reason that it's quite so interesting. How can we manipulate, how can we benefit from this and other types of synergistic relationships that happen in multi-species wards? Okay, so the other way, uh, framing it from the soil point of view, soil has a huge impact on plants and we're in a country that's, that the weather can be described, especially today, as wet, wet, and wetter. And when I start talking about our experimental work on drought, I remember the first time I mentioned it in front of a group of farmers and advisors about 10 years ago, and they were openly laughing at the kind of experiments that we're doing looking at drought. Except nobody was laughing in 2018, and we had a huge forage shortage all across the country, certainly uh, around us in Wexford, and you can see our experimental site within two months had turned into something that you'd more likely see in Nairobi than Johnstown Castle. 
So uh, the role of mixtures to mitigate against drought has been often talked about, but actually very rarely experimentally investigated, which is what we set out to do. So here's an example of the experimental plots uh, and experimental drought shelters that we implement. These are three meters by five meters. Um, we're using combinations of perennial ryegrass, chicory, deep-rooting chicory, uh, red clover, and deep-rooting, sorry, deep-rooting red clover, and shallower rooting white clover. We're implementing these in multiple, uh, multiple compositions and manipulating their proportions to get a spread of types of mixtures. So uh, over, over the course of a year, we are taking, in this example, six cuts. You can see the black bars show the yield and the control. The uh, white bars show the yield of the drought-affected plots. You can see the bar at the top of the screen. Sorry, this is a pre-recorded a pre animation that's kicking <laughs> in. Um, the, the red bar at the very top of the screen is... Um, is the drought that's implemented for nine weeks. So we're taking a harvest during the drought, at the end of the drought, and then there's a recovery period. And what I'm going to focus on here is the yield and the variation in yield in the three, uh, the three harvests that are indicated by the, by the uh, red circle. So here on the left-hand side is the Wexford site. We've got yield over three harvests, so that's why these are not massive yields, and related to species richness, and you can see in both the Wexford site on the left-hand side and the Zurich site on the right-hand side, there is an increase in yield, a significant increase in yield, as we increase species richness from monocultures of ryegrass and clovers, uh, chicory and, uh, yeah, the three, clovers, grass and chicory, uh, to four species combinations of them. So species, limited amounts of manipulation of species richness in these plots can drive uh, responses in yield. In addition, the, uh, the variation in yield, you can see the bars here, is also declining as species richness increases. So this is the gold standard for yield stability. Not only is the variation lower, but the response is higher. So this is in the rain-fed control outside of those drought shelters. When we look at, and we genuinely didn't know, how would these responses look like in the plots under the drought shelters? So when we look at that, we see that there's an overall suppression of yield, as you would expect because of the effect of drought, but the response to species richness is still present. And just looking at that uh, in more detail, here we can see the reduction due to drought between the left hand and the, the left hand side, uh, the average monoculture on the left hand side is shown in, as in a green line. The average monoculture on the right hand side shows that uh, under drought, and the difference reflects the overall reduction in yield by drought, and the diversity effect, the kick that we get from increasing uh, plant richness, is indicated by this, this green bar here. So this is showing that the mixtures, even under drought, can yield higher than the monocultures under rain-fed conditions, which suggests that these could be uh, a real adaptation option to this environmental variation uh, within grasslands. Okay, so with this, with, so we've shown that we can improve yield stability under environmental variation using drought, using four species. And of course, as, as researchers, our next question is, well, what happens if we push it beyond four? So we fixed on six species. So we assembled these six species in a particular way. So uh, at the top of this triangle is, represent, is, is representing a monoculture, 100% of one, one functional group, which would be legumes. The bottom left is 100% of grass, and the bottom right is 100% legume. And we can use these as a, as a systematic way of manipulating the evenness or the proportions of the contribution of legumes, grasses, and herbs to different types of mixtures. So here we have the 50-50 combinations of each of those three. And here we have, uh, in the very center, the equiproportional mixture of two grasses, two herbs, and two legumes. Okay? So this is quite important because later on, a lot of the responses will be presented as heat maps across this kind of a design space. So I just want to really emphasize that at the outer edges, at the corners, we've got monoculture, or sorry, a single functional group, grass, legume, herb. At those outer center points is the 50-50 combination of grass, legume, 50-50 grass, herb, 50-50 legume, herb. And then in the very center point, we get evenness increasing to a maximum point in the middle where it's all six species, one-sixth of each, okay? 
Is everybody clear on that? <laughs> okay, so we've got grasses on the bottom left, uh, clovers on the top, uh, plantain, for example, and chicory monocultures on the, uh, represented at the other vertice. And then in the middle, we've got this six species, uh, uh, six species mixture. And we have a drought treatment imposed on top, on top of that. So we've got plant diversity being manipulated and a drought treatment as a control, uh, sorry, as a treatment. And they look like that in the field. And we do our measurements. And it, so on the left-hand side here, what we have is our legume, grass, and herb design with a heat map of yield. So on the very bottom there, you can see that we've got tons of harvested forage over, it's an average of two years. Uh, and the greener it is, the more yield that you're getting. And with these concentric rings, this is showing that we get very strong synergistic or mixing effects. There's, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts by a long way. Uh, you can see the suppressive effect of the yields, the colors that, the colors on the right hand side, these, this is the uh, drought treatment. These are slightly towards the left hand side of the color chart reflecting that suppressive effect of the drought on yield, which you'd expect. But you still see this very strong interaction effect. Again, there's very clearly a message that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, even under drought, indicating that uh, the functional group diversity of plants enhances forage yield, not, under, not just under good conditions, but also when there's an environmental disturbance. Just taking some of the points in particular, here is the equi-proportional point under rain fed, which is just touching up to 12 tonnes per hectare. Uh, here is the equi-proportional point in the uh, drought treatment, which is just over 10.5. And here is, a, for a comparison, in the same experimental design, we had 300 uh, kgs of nitrogen on a low neoprene monoculture. So you can see that, again, the plant species mixtures here, which were in plots at 150 kgs, uh, with half of the nitrogen, by manipulating plant richness, we can achieve yields that exceed 300 kgs of nitrogen on low neoprene. Okay, so I'm going to use this, this experimental design uh, in, in a couple of further examples because we're very fortunate to have Chagask and other, uh, other funding agencies investing several PhD students into this single experiment. And uh, we like to make the most of it when we go to the bother of, in of, of investing in these plots. So the next thing I want to look at is nitrous oxide emissions from the soil under these plots. And uh, Saoirse Comins was a PhD student uh, looking at this. And overall, we find, again, at the, at the top, you've got the grass, which has a much lower uh, nitrous oxide emission, uh, similar to the herb, because they're on the yellow side of the scale. And as we increase the legume proportion, we see this very, very strong response with nitrous oxide emissions uh, up to 2.2, whatever the units are, uh, kilos per hectare per year, um, compared to about 1.2 uh, in the grass or the herb. So it's very clear, and it's not a huge surprise the more nitrogen that there is in the system due to the clover, the more nitrous oxide emissions you get. Sorry, is there any additional nitrogen being put in? There's 150 kgs of nitrogen on, uh, on top of that. Yeah, on all of the plots equally. Yeah. Um, it's the same plots as previously. So, um, so, that's, so this is a, a plant-specific, legume-specific response on top of the fertilizer response. When we look at it in terms of nitrous oxide emissions intensity, we correct it for the amount of yield produced produced, we get this again, very strong synergistic effects where the mixtures are greatly reducing the, compared to the legumes and the grass alone, greatly reducing the emissions intensity. For those of us who like the traditional way of presenting these data, <laughs> here's a bar chart, again, showing the, the perennial ryegrass with 300 kgs of nitrogen, as you would predict, with very, very high levels of nitrous oxide emissions intensity. Uh, we've got the perennial ryegrass with, with half of the nitrogen uh, applied, and then the six species mixture, which is significantly lower again. Okay, moving on to soil biodiversity, and I do want to point out that this work was done by Israel Ekoye, who's in the, in the audience in the back here. Israel recently took up a new permanent position in UCC. He's a, a fantastic collaborator in soil nematodes, soil microbiology, bioinformatics, and if you're interested in collaborating with him, I would say uh, get your skates on and rush to collaborate before he's too busy with other people to collaborate. Fantastic uh, colleague. So Israel's uh, expertise in the EU master project was looking at different types of nematodes under these same plots. And we were looking at, does plant diversity in a very limited way within these intensively managed, very productive mixtures, 
can it affect soil health as reflected in soil biodiversity? So we're looking at nematodes, and this is quite novel, looking at nematodes uh, and their different types of feeding groups and also their functional, uh, sorry, their taxonomic groupings. Um, I don't know, I wouldn't recognize any of these under a microscope, that's Israel's expertise, but we had about 27 different types of taxonomic functional groups in the, uh, detected, and we found very, very strong relationships with plant diversity. So here we've got the different types of groupings, functional groupings of, of nematodes, and on the very right-hand side you can see the six-species mixture, which is the only one that had very high, well, higher numbers of predators so these would be the top of the nematode food chain. Uh, they tend to occur only where soil, where soil health is usually much better. And uh, we can also see a corresponding reduction in plant, or, uh, plant feeding herbivore nematodes, which would often be associated with uh, plant perform reductions in plant performance and possibly transmission of plant diseases. So overall, to summarize, there was a very strong effect of plant diversity on the underlying soil biodiversity measured through nematodes. Um, just, uh, I wasn't going to include this, but as a gift to Israel, who I didn't realize was going to be here until this morning, here's again a similar chart, or a similar ternary diagram as before, again showing this strong synergistic effect, this whole greater than the sum of the parts effect of the plants on nematode diversity. Okay, finally, just want to talk about the, I learned a trick this morning. If I say finally in enough times, I can get through about six more slides. <laughs> um, I want to talk about legacy effects. So we've got the exact same experimental design as before with Guy Langrange's work, uh, which was looking at the drought experiment. And after the two years, Guy Lang said, I want to look at legacy effects. And I said, oh, I don't know, I haven't done this before. And he said, trust me. And he was right. Um, so we took those experimental plots uh, sprayed them off with herbicide, uh, did a light tillage, and re in a monoculture of Italian ryegrass. So that meant that the following growth of Italian ryegrass is effectively a model crop in a model rotational system that we can use to measure what is the effect of the preceding plant diversity in the grassland lay on the follow-on crop in a model rotation. So again, we see on the left-hand side here is the rain-fed the rain control. Uh, you can see the effect of the, sorry, the, the, the legacy effect is, is strongly related to the proportion of legumes in the preceding grassland lay. There is no whole being greater than the sum of the parts. It's a direct proportional relationship to how much clover is in it. Probably not that, sm not that surprising. And even, uh, in, in this year after the, uh, after, sorry, after implementing this follow-on crop, there's still a residual drought impact, which we weren't expecting. So that's quite interesting as well. From a systems point of view, I just want to pick out specific examples from this design space to compare them. So here, we're comparing everything to the lowly and perenne with 150 kilos of nitrogen as a reference level of biomass production. And on the top in A with the clover and 150 kgs of nitrogen, we're seeing uh, an increase relative to lowly and perenne in clover. Underneath that in B, we've got the six species mixture and we're seeing a very strong increase in yield in the grassland phase. And underneath that, we've got the 300 kg of uh, lowly, 300 kg application on lowly and perenne. So if we skip from that grassland phase in the middle over to the right hand side, when we look at the performance of these three on the legacy effect, that is the production of Italian ryegrass as this model follow-on crop, we see the clover, as you might expect, doing very, very well. The, the what do we call it, the six species mixture has a residual legacy effect, which is greater than the control and greater than 150 kg lowly and perenne. And we see a negative effect of the high nitrogen lowly and perenne. So overall, we conclude that the high diversity six species mixture with the lower input at 150 kilos over these two parts of the crop rotation actually give us a much higher overall output than the low diversity monoculture of lowly and perenne with 300 kg kgs of nitrogen. Okay, I think I will leave it at that. Uh, so to summarize, this work has shown the relate how soil factors strongly interact with multi-species swords for yield production, drought resilient, they affect uh, drought resilience, they affect nitrous oxide emissions intensity, 
soil biodiversity and have a very strong effect on legacy effects, which we are hoping to explore a lot more in our new EU legume legacy project and also an international voluntary network called LegacyNet. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. John, that was uh, really interesting. Um, I do have one question. On the nitrous oxide emissions, the emissions were higher under pure legume compared with grass. There's been comparison made with the emissions under legumes without inorganic fertiliser, with fertilised grass. We didn't have that comparison. It'd be interesting to see, maybe. Yeah. But I can say that with Suzanne and yeah. our new multi for more project, we're going to be looking at exactly that, oh, to, cool. look at the, to look at the nitrous oxide emissions yeah. at different levels of 0, 75 and 150 kgs of nitrogen with that, with that spread of plant diversity as well. Yeah. And looking at nitrous oxide. So okay. I'll, I'll be back in three years' time. Well, it's a bit across the previous, so do call it. <laughs> <laughs> so any questions quickly from the floor for, for John? Of your normal conventional system, so I was just wondering why you didn't look at that, and, and why your minimum was 150, because it's not really a, a fair comparison for what herbalists have been shown to. to uh, you put. When you say it's not fair compared to other work looking at zero. Yes. Yeah, or, or much lower. Yep. Uh, at the time, we had a huge discussion about this, and we were aiming our results at. Uh, dairy farmers in Ireland who we knew there was intense policy pressure coming to reduce from very high levels to a more moderate 150. This work was designed seven years ago and that, I mean, that, that goalpost has already shifted, which is why in the new multi for more experiment we're starting with 0, 75 and the top level is 150. Thank you. Okay, I think we probably have time for one quick question if anyone has one. Um, will there be Um, was it seven? Uh, was sorry it to disappoint you, it's still only six. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. It, it's a very fair point, and um, it's something we're actually we're, we're writing about this at the moment. Is the design principles for these kinds of mixtures? It's um, when you've got we've got very clear objectives, which is maximizing the nutrient use efficiency to deliver high yielding, high forage quality of very digestible plant species. And if you pick the four, five, or six best then including the next best can only start bringing down your average performance. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a fair point that probably to prove that we should be comparing with 9, 12, 15. Mm -hmm. But even from a logical point of view or a modeling point of view, it's quite easy to think that if you drift away from your top four or five, all you're doing by including the 10th species, we say in a variety trial, is reducing your overall performance. You're displacing a better performing species all of the time. That's if you're looking, it depends on your objectives. I mean, if your objective is species richness or maybe enhancing the legacy effect or increasing carbon soil, soil carbon sequestration, that design principle will change. But for high yielding forage, that's the way we're looking at it at the moment. Okay, that's great. Um, I did want to ask a question about persistence, but I can maybe talk to you over coffee. <laughs> um, there is coffee and tea outside. We do have another session which was due to start at three. So. Could I maybe ask anyone who's interested in the, the panel discussion to maybe come back about quarter, 3.15, I'm looking at Elizabeth, 3.15, so grab a coffee and bring it in here and then we'll um, start the, thank you very much, John, I appreciate Thanks, that, Lisa, thank yeah. you.